10, the Antikythera device. I think I said that right. The Antikythera mechanism or device, I mean, this sounds like something straight out of Call of Duty Zombies, but the discovery comes to us straight from the magical land of antiquity, the land of marble, democracy, and olive oil. Very nice, beautiful, it's more Italian than Greek, but okay, we're gonna go with it. In 1901, Greek divers found a shipwreck not too far from the island of Antikythera. Naturally, they looked in to see what was inside. Remnants of cargo included pottery, coins, jewels, and a strange gear-like device. Later, it was dubbed the Antikythera device. It was also later discovered to be that of a very early analog computer. Ooh. It was a fancy way of saying a basic or manual power computer that calculates simple solutions or that of a singular solution. It might not sound like much, but to me, it's a very unique find. Sure, this machine was simple, but it makes us wonder what else may have been lost to time. It's thought to have been used as an astrological calendar, aiding the user in mapping out where the sun and moon will be on different dates. Pretty cool. Pretty. I don't know how how do they do that though? That's, you know what I mean? Like, how do they think of that? I couldn't even think of that. I'm a modern guy. Jeez. Number nine, purple orb. I've been around for a little while now, and in my scientific research, I've seen my fair share of orbs. You got Goku's Kamehameha, you got the orbs in Mario Party. Heck, I've chased so many orbs in Call of Duty Zombies, I've lost count. The point I'm making here is I know an orb when I see an orb. I know one when I see one. The purple orb found at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean floor, not too far from the California coast. Well, well, frankly, I have no idea what this is, said also the scientist who discovered it in 2016 while exploring the ocean floor. Scientists discovered a purple spherical blob, aptly named Blobus purplus. You, you can't get better than that, folks. Naturally, using a very high-tech device called a vacuum, we sucked that bad boy up like a farmer gets sucked up in a UFO in the middle of a cornfield in Arkansas. For further analysis, of course, what else? The verdict? Eh, we ain't too sure yet. It could be some form of sea slug, but if that's the case, it's the first purple one ever caught, showing that if you look hard enough, you can find shiny Pokemon too. Ooh. Number eight, the Megalodon. This one goes out to all the people who went to see a movie called Jaws in the 70s and had no idea what they were in for. I can only imagine what kind of pants soiling experience that must have been. For our younger audience to understand, there just wasn't any movie like Jaws around back then. It was pretty unique. A summer blockbuster and it changed film forever, honestly. It also made people think twice about going into deep water at the beach. You never know, I know this is, that was a movie, but you, you never know, <laughs> said people. Well. What if I told you Jaws weren't too far from the truth? Yes, that's right, folks. Fossils have been found dating back to 20 million years ago, and these fossils belong to that of the mega shark the Megalodon. A great white shark is anywhere between four and a half meters to around eight meters at the most. The Meg, as she's commonly called, she's estimated to be around 17 meters. That's over 50 feet in American, folks. That, that, that's a big fish, man. While a full fossil has never been found, teeth and some bone paint an image of a very beastly fish. Not what I want to cross. I, don't, I, just, I just stay out of the water. I like water, but I like swimming pools, chlorine. I'd rather swim in pee than with sharks. Okay, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm here, that's what I'm here to tell you, folks. Number seven. Yellow Brick Road. Deep sea divers may have found the road to Atlantis, or Oz, one of the two. Back in May 2022, this bizarre path was spotted in the Pacific after an exploration vessel, Nautilus, caught the rocky formation near Hawaii. Just a nice place of unknown everything in that ocean. Awesome, we love exploring. The exploration team said in a recent interview with Wyon News that our corps of exploration have witnessed incredibly unique and fascinating geological formations while diving on the Lili Ukulani Ridge. The 90 degree fractures are most likely the results from, you know, a big eruption from a volcano a long, long time ago. The Marine National Monument, or PNMM for short, is the largest fully protected conservation area in the world. So. Let's, let's not litter anymore, maybe, I don't know. It covers more than 580,000 square miles in the ocean. So far, we've only discovered 3% of its seafloor, so I'm sure there's many more discoveries of roads, apparently, leading to Atlantis. Let's hope. Number six, the Great Lakes Griffin. Back in 2018, in Lake Michigan, diver Steve Leibert found what he believed was the holy grail of Great Lakes shipwrecks. Now, this is exciting to some. I can't even look at photos. I have thalassophobia. The Griffin sank back in 1679. Divers have been searching for this beauty for a very long time. As a kid, Steve himself, Steve Leibert, was talking about the shipwreck when his history teacher stopped and said, hey, who knows? Maybe one of you will find the Griffin. Imagine that your grade eight teacher tells you somebody will find a ship one day and that somebody was actually you. Yeah, at 76 years old, Steve discovered the wreck. It was 2018, but his research began 40 years ago. Leibert began diving back in 1981 after an amazing teacher got him motivated. It took a long time to track down, of course, but 
I think it was worth it, we can all agree. If you're in any Great Lakes, keep your eyes open for, you know, 50 foot long sh ships from the 1600s. They're always lurking below. That's why I can't swim. Like I put goggles on, look down, and see the top of a ship. I would throw up, I would literally, that's it. Maybe because I'm like afraid of heights, and for some reason when I'm in like the ocean or like a lake, I feel like I'm up high. Maybe that's what it is. Number five, toxic waste. Okay, we mentioned a yellow brick road. It's always fun, it's a fun time, a creepy looking discovery, but certainly not harmful like this next one here. Yeah, for the back nine, we're gonna crank it up a bit. Sometimes we find literal barrels of waste. This dump site here was discovered off the coast of LA. It's 3,000 feet deep, and these ROVs, these deep ROVs found around 27,000 barrels of waste. Looks like the climax of a Breaking Bad finale. It's just, what is going on down here? What happened? Who put these here? The 2021 discovery was deemed staggering. Yeah, that's one of many words I can say on YouTube, for sure. You can literally see in these photos like this aura of toxic waste, like just a, a plume of evil coming from these barrels. That's brutal. Recycle, please. Number four, the frilled shark. Also alarming, just in its own natural, terrifying way. Back in 2004, marine biologists discovered a dinosaur. Yeah, they discovered the frilled shark. It was lurking around 870 meters below the surface. Now this one looks like an eel, almost. It's so scary, I don't know. Frilled sharks can grow up to seven feet long, and they fight like daredevil. They can hunt in complete darkness. They don't have to look, they just use their senses, and they don't use sunlight. I almost got lost there while I was doing that bit, but if I was a frilled shark, I'd be dead on still, I'd be fine. They don't need to see anything, so remember that next time you're skinny dipping. Unless you can hold your breath for a long time, you won't actually run into the frilled shark, so don't worry about that. They're only found a mile below the surface, and again, they're rare as hell. Have you ever dealt one of these? Are you a diver? Have you seen a shark? Comment down below some of your diving nightmares, just so I can read them, and then go, oh, I'm never going in the ocean ever again. That's what I like doing. I like going, oh, I'm never doing that ever again. That's what Reddit's for. Number three, the big squid. This one is simple. In the last couple years, both unmanned expeditions and cameras attached to deep sea drilling rigs have caught footage of giant squids. This is impressive for two reasons. One, their size. I mean, these guys are massive, and well, two, because of their elusive nature and the fact they live really far down in the ocean, we just don't know that much about them and or have that much footage on them. So we take anything we can get. The largest squid on record from head to, uh, well, tentacle or appendage, whatever you want to call it, measured in at a whopping 43 feet. That's a big, that's a, that's a big squid, man. It's almost hard to imagine creatures living that far down there that big. It's a good thing it's difficult for us to get down there. Not that I have any interest going down there, it's just, you know, it's. I'm not so scared. I'm not scared or scared. I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared. Number two, anglerfish. Here's another horror from the depths of the ocean. Folks around my age may recall the anglerfish from the terrifying moment in the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. Movies and media is how I relate to things. Just trust me. Remember the part with the ice cream? Remember he's got the ice cream and he's eating them? Remember that part? Yeah, it's weird. Anglerfish are best known for their third appendage that in some anglerfish possess the ability of bioluminescence or like a fluffy antenna that kind of just hangs off the forehead. What's the reason for this decorative dancey bit? Well, it's to lure in food. Uh, like a fishing lure but that we would use. Kind of cool. That's when it strikes with its razor sharp teeth and the most awful surprise attack ever from probably one of the most, if not the, ugliest fish out of the ocean. Number one, crop circles. Most crop circles that you find are found in cornfields in middle America, where people claim that little green men came to visit them in the middle of the night. I swear it's by. Well, as some divers discovered in 1995, there were crop circles at the bottom of the ocean, but what could make those, aliens? No one knew what was causing them. Well, it turns out that in 2011, the mystery was solved. It was actually a cute puffer fish, or I say one. It was actually a species of cute puffer fish that were making art on the ocean floor with their fins in hopes of recruiting a mate. It's a good thing I don't have to use art because I was never good at trying. It wouldn't go very well. Good thing I got cute little blue eyes. Oh my goodness. Kicking off our list at number 10, Proxima Centauri. All right, we'll start this list off out in the cosmos. Why not? The closest star to us, of course, other than our own sun, is Proxima Centauri. This star is 4.2 light years away, so whatever is sending this signal, or this message rather, well, I don't think we got it soon enough. One planet that orbits the star out of two is most likely similar to our own. It's rocky in nature, so who knows, maybe these are our cosmic neighbors sending out a few bleeps and bloops to let us know that they're out there. Graduate from the Pennsylvania State University and team member on the initial discovery, Sophia Sheik, they say, quote, it's pretty expected that every now and then you'll see something weird. But this is interesting because it's something that's weird that we're having to think about the next steps. 
end quote. Yeah, let's look into this, please. Notifications, let's turn them on. Who's out there sending those beeps and boops? Are there aliens? I vote yes. Maybe. I vote maybe. Number nine, underwater TIE fighters. This next sound, this next signal is pretty odd. It's coming from our own planet this time, so. Imagine you're scuba diving, right? You're looking for a nice seashell for the wife, and all of a sudden, you hear this underwater. Yeah, it's hard collecting seashells, again, for the wife, when you hear a TIE fighter flying around below you. What in the world is this? What did we just hear? It definitely had some people stumped for a while when it was first heard, but luckily, this one has a fairly simple and maybe harmless explanation. The Star Wars sound that you just heard is actually coming from dwarf mink whales. Many strange ocean noises end up either being attributed to whales or icebergs. One of the two Goliaths that you don't want to bump into. And considering how creepy the sounds can be when they have no explanation, I'm kind of glad to know that most things end up being relatively harmless and way less scary in reality. Number eight, Saturn signal. All right, this one comes from Thanos' home planet. Titan is one of Saturn's many moons. Saturn has 82 moons in total. So if you were a werewolf and you lived on Saturn, you'd be exhausted. Around 10 years ago, NASA's Cassini spacecraft detected water in its shell of ice. Now that's pretty exciting, that's great. To quote a Cassini team member, the search for water is an important goal in solar system exploration, and now we've spotted another place where it's abundant. End quote. Yeah, we love abundant sea creatures resting on the moon Titan. For sure, that's not a, an Avengers level threat at all. Yikes. NASA has also detected low frequency radio waves on that same icy moon, and it sounds pretty eerie. To know this is off planet entirely, and that there's water involved, and there's signals coming from here, it gives me the creeps. I don't know, are these humans trying to send us messages? Maybe not, I can't see them, it's hard to tell. Number seven, the city of Bai. Okay, so Romans, right? I mean, no one does it like the Romans do. Gold, marble, parties. When they sent it, buddy, it was full scent. Well, what if I told you that the Romans had a Las Vegas? Eh, well, sort of. Obviously, there wasn't a majestic city in the middle of the desert with slot machines, line dancers, and Elvis Presley, but both cities were both built by corrupt Italian leaders. Oh, look at that. Some of these guys wore armor, and the others wore suits, so it, yeah, kind of makes sense. The city of Bailly was a resort town in the modern sense. A lot of Roman emperors, politicians owned villas there, which attracted other wealthy folks. Kind of like Las Vegas. Despite even Caesar himself owning property here, the city now unfortunately rests under the water, where you can find remnants of Roman activity, fragments of street, pottery, statues, coins, the works. It's not every day you get to visit a Roman resort underwater. It's located in the Mediterranean Sea, just west of the Italian coast. It's close enough to the ocean for me. Close enough, I think it counts, it's pretty cool. Number six, Pavla Petri. Similar to Bailly, but on a much more discovered on accident kind of deal. In 1967, a man named Nicholas Fleming was snorkeling in the area and well, just so happened to see some weird stuff that he thought resembled a street. Naturally, when he got out of the water and told everybody, no one believed him. So, yeah, right, you're not telling the truth, yeah? It's not true, you're not, no. But after the area was mapped out in 1968, well, it turns out he was telling the truth. Here was the sunken city of Pablo Petri. What they found there was surprising. There were streets, grids, and foundations of buildings remaining. Even a small staircase. With all this evidence present, it's speculated that earthquakes around 1000 BCE are what sunk the city. However, what's most most interesting is that it's speculated they were there from around 2800 BCE. So they're there for a long time, and the earthquake took them out. Kind of cool. The earthquakes are not cool, but the story is cool. Number five, the goblin shark. This animal is why I would hate being a scientist, but also would make for great TV. I get scared easily. It'd be kind of cool. Imagine there was a shark, but Mother Nature wasn't completely sold on the design. Okay, sure, it's fast and lethal and naturally blends into the waters to make an apex predator, but it, it just needs something more, Mother Nature said. Oh, I know. Let's add nail-like teeth and an extendable jaw. Oh, and, and a Jedi sixth sense. Yeah. That's that sounds right. Yes. That is right. The goblin sharks are the weird distant cousin of the shark. They live at the bottom of the ocean floor and eat pretty much whatever they can find down there. They hunt in darkness using their elongated snout that has literally a spider sense when something gets close to it, and a jaw that extends to help them grab food. It's like having Commando Pro from MW2, if anyone remembers that. Remember that one? That was hard. That was a tough perk, man. It got in the way of a lot of things. It just goes to show that there's a lot of weird things at the bottom of the ocean, and it, it really, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we find some more weird stuff down there. 
down there. It's gonna happen one day. Number four, shipwreck of the San Jose. San Jose was part of the Spanish treasure fleet in the early 1700s, which in case you didn't know, was basically big boats for carrying all their loot and booty back to Spain. These ships were filled with everything of value, spices, tobacco, booze, silver, gems, metals, and most importantly, gold. Oh yes. I mean, that was the reason why they were there. She sank in 1708, but not too far from Colombia. She was eventually found by the Colombian Navy and has since been guarded as a state secret. Hmm, I wonder why. Hmm. The estimated value of the loot inside the ship's hull is to be worth around $15 billion US. Wow, that's a lot of money. Number three, big boom. Turning the calendar back to May 2010 in Pennsylvania, a little more recent, residents were enjoying their day off when, you guessed it, a loud boom, or this big boom really, shook residents. Figuratively and literally, it shook them. Resident Kim Owen reported to the Sun Gazette news outlet that at first she didn't think much about it, but that was until a friend of hers who lives only a few blocks down the street posted on Facebook about the same noise. The post was reaching out to others in the community asking if they too heard this loud boom. So far, the leading theory here, believe it or not, is meteorites crashing into Earth and then burning up. The more plausible scenario is that these booms are caused by high pressure gases being released from the Earth's surface. Either way, no thanks. Number two, slow down. Not to be confused with slow ride, that's an absolute banger from the 70s, that's a good time, Guitar Hero classic. Slow down, that was recorded on May 19th, 1997. Slow down was picked up in the equatorial Pacific Ocean, just in the middle of absolute nowhere. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration picked it up not once, but several times every year since. This random signal, our best guess as to what the sound is, is moving ice in Antarctica. But the fascinating part here is that the sound decreases in frequency over time. So it's moving, it's going away, it's shrinking, I don't know. It takes about seven minutes in total for the sound to end, so we can't include the entire clip or you'd be pretty bored. But here's that same sound 16 times as fast, so you know what we're talking about. Scientists believe that the sound is a massive iceberg scratching against the ocean floor over the course of seven minutes until it comes to a stop. But the fact that we hear this sound every year, I don't know, is it the Kraken? Maybe it's the Kraken waking up or going to sleep, hopefully the latter. And finally, number one, the hum. This one creeps me out a lot and I had to finish off our list today with it. I think I've heard the hum, personally. I think I've actually witnessed this noise IRL. Or maybe it was just Kid Cudi in the distance. I don't know, one of the two. The hum has been heard for decades. We have no idea where the hum is coming from, but our best guess is that it has something to do with our oceans. A resident from Woodland, England spoke out on their experience, saying that this hum would vibrate throughout the entire house. Quote, we've turned all the electricity off in the house and we can still hear it, so it's not that. And it's not tinnitus, that's a high pitched sound, and this is very low. If I put my fingers in my ears, it stops, so I know it's not in my head. Yeah, what's going on here? It's heard Commonly in Hawaii, Britain, North America, some have called it the Windsor hum. In Windsor, which is insanely close to us right now, hence why I think I've heard it. But I have no idea. I point the microphone to you now for this one, just to finish our list off. Have you ever heard the hum? If so, where were you? And how much did it sound like Kid Cudi on a scale of 110? Reports of the hum go back to New Mexico in 1991, so I feel like it's not going anywhere soon, whatever it is. Number 10, Roman sea curses. Okay, the first century, a great place to begin with most things that are horrible and new to humans. Romans did things a little differently. We can't figure out yet how they engineered aqueducts or how that many people watched Colosseum battles. Yeah, I can't watch an arm bar during UFC, let alone bring my family to the Colosseum. Be like, that's a lion. That's a, that's a guy getting eaten by the lion. Yeah, it's him. Ancient Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, he wrote a book on natural history. And in said book, this go-to, might I add, on ancient history, the Elder wrote about half-human, half-fish creatures that he called Nereids. Hmm, that sounds like uh, mermaids, avatar, I don't even know, Atlanteans? He even added to his first observation detailing that the human parts of said body were covered in rough scales. Human in appearance, but still fishy nonetheless, awesome. Guess we have those to look forward to? The Elder also recalls a seaman who would climb ships at night and then sink them. Kind of like Aquaman, only he wouldn't help people. He would actually put them in life-threatening situations. But still cool, he probably looked like a bad 
climb on that ship, you know? Number nine, sirens, AKA mermaids. Here we go, figured I'd talk about these ones as well. The mythology surrounding sirens, it's interesting, but I don't know how I feel about it yet. We have to talk about it in the comments. I don't think we have Atlanteans flirting with sailors per se, but I do believe there's some sort of creature that's hybrid human fish, you know what I mean? On his first trip overseas in 1493, Christopher Columbus claims to have seen not one, but three sirens. Yeah, he even wrote about it. He said they rose well out of the sea, but they are not so beautiful as they are said to be. Okay, he's rhyming, that's always fun. Thank you, Columbus. For their faces had some masculine traits. That's what he added afterwards. I would think I'd be a very cute mermaid. Honestly, thank you so much. I could probably trick Christopher Columbus and be like, hey, come to this island. Just wave in and do my little fish thing, whatever. So what did Christopher Columbus see? I mean, when it comes to correctly identifying places and or people, obviously Chris can get confused. He's not really our go-to guy, I don't think anymore. So historians believe Columbus may have seen a few manatees and not mermaids. Either way, I'm like, you know what? Both are kind of terrifying to see out of nowhere. Number eight, the Kraken. For ages now, sailors from Norway and Greenland have shared tales of this giant sea monster, and you've probably heard about it as well. Or if you've seen the hit franchise, Pirates of the Caribbean, you've probably seen it in IMAX. Tentacles big enough to pluck you out of your boat. This thing is terrifying, right? We all know about the Kraken. In 1857, Danish naturalist Jephedas Strinstrup found a large squid beak, and soon after was sent parts of another specimen from the Bahamas, okay? So something was out there. He concludes that the Kraken is real, and that this was proof, and that these parts were maybe part of a species of giant squid called Architeuthis dux, which translates to ruling squid in Latin. Very little is known about giant ruling squid, of course, because they're so hard to track, but we did get a photo of one in 2005 and a video of another in 2013. Number seven, Piper Navajo. The temperatures were ideal. The sky was clear, it was warm, there really shouldn't have been a problem, but for Irving Rivers, the secret of what happened to him that day will remain with him wherever he is. On November 3rd, 1978, Rivers left St. Croix, one of the US Virgin Islands, Islands in his plane called the Piper Navajo. He was piloting for Eastern Caribbean Airways and was an extremely experienced pilot. While making a solo flight to pick up passengers, the control tower operator told him to avoid a spot of showers and Rivers made the adjustment. This is where it gets weird. The controller saw the lights of his plane and cleared him for landing, like he saw them glowing in the sky. But soon after another plane departed, Rivers' lights completely disappeared. The red and green lights he saw blinking before were nowhere in sight, and even stranger, his plane disappeared on the radar. An emergency search went out, but nothing. They found absolutely nothing. This dude's plane literally disappeared 1.6 kilometers from landing, and nothing, no trace, no debris, nothing was found. Number six, the witchcraft. I wouldn't be surprised if there was some kind of magic involved with the Bermuda Triangle, but witchcraft was actually the name of the ship. On December 22nd, a 23 foot long luxury yacht crewed by two gentlemen, Dan Brack and Father Patrick Horgan, went out to enjoy a dazzling Christmas view of Miami. But then a mile offshore, the yacht radioed that they'd hit something, but there didn't appear to be damage. They asked to be towed ashore anyway, and the Coast Guard set out immediately. It took them 20 minutes to reach the site, but when they got there, there was nothing. They knew that aboard the craft, there were tons of flares, life vests, lifeboats, and distress signal devices, including a special design installed by Barack. He put an extra flotation device designed in such a way that even if the hull was ruptured, a part of the ship would still be able to float. But there was no sign that the ship had even been there. They searched 1,200 square miles, but still, nothing. Number five, the mystery of the derelict. The Ellen Austin was a white oak schooner that was sailing from New York to London in 1881. But a discovery they made during their voyage stopped them in their tracks. A derelict ship was seen floating aimlessly near the Bermuda Triangle. Captain Baker, captain of the Ellen, waited two days before approaching it just in case it was a trap. When he hopped aboard, he found no sign of any crew, though it was well packed and fully stocked. In order to tow it back, the captain placed a crew on the ship so they could sail it back together. But as they tried to do just that, a storm hit, separating them. After it cleared, Baker saw the ship drifting once again and chased it down. But just like how he'd found it, the ship was entirely crewless. Not a sign of the men he had placed on there was found. They abandoned the ship, fearing that whatever was on it was cursed. Number four, the ghost ship of the Outer Banks. If you love that show, I know what you thought of. 
To earn a name like that, something crazy must have happened, and that it did. A massive schooner known as the Carol A. Deering was discovered completely abandoned by the Coast Guard and has ghost story written all over it. While returning from Hampton Roads, Virginia, from Barbados on January 29th, 1921, she passed the Cape Lookout Lightship. The officer reported that the crew seemed disorganized and confused, but the crew reported that they had lost their anchors. The last time the ship would be seen was by another ship, the SS Lake Elon, who said the Deering looked like it was heading a weird direction. At 6.30 am on January 31st, the ship was seen run aground on the shoals with the decks awash, sails set, lifeboats missing and therefore seemingly abandoned. But all personal belongings were left behind, including navigational equipment, crucial papers, and there was indeed no anchor on the ship. The weirdest thing though was the food laid out as if someone was in the middle of preparing food. Rumors of rum running and even pirates surrounding the wreckage, but no one has ever solved the mystery of their disappearance. Number three. The deepest shipwreck. The USS Johnston was a US Navy destroyer which sank during the Battle of Samar back in 1944. It was after a battle with a large fleet of Japanese warships and it went down. Now Victor Vescavo, who was one of the few people who has made the dive into the Marianas Trench, that's why his name sounds familiar, he was one of the people who first stumbled upon the remains of this sunken warship. The ship's remains were first found in 2019 and was known as the deepest known shipwreck as it was found 6,456 meters deep in the Philippine Sea in the Pacific Ocean. I lost track of what I was saying. That's It's so deep, I can't even imagine. That's like a mountain, you know what I'm saying? We have a new record holder, believe it or not. Yeah, the world's deepest shipwreck was discovered four miles underwater in the Philippines. Yeah, this is now the world's deepest shipwreck that was ever discovered. This is terrifying. Uh, I want to move on right now. I'm going to throw up. Number two, loud ocean heat. This is just naturally and so scary. Here we go. How depressing is this one? Okay, back in 1991, scientists lowered these massive speakers, like nightclub subwoofers almost, into the waters at Heard Island. Also, like Heard Island speakers, is this a bit? I wish I was making this up. They made the pun for me. They did my job. I'm upset. These speakers emitted low frequency sounds all across our oceans. Now, these signals were later picked up by receivers near California and Bermuda. And these signals contain information on the temperature of our oceans. Our oceans absorb more than 90% of energy left from global warming. Doesn't help when we lower 27,000 barrels of into it. So let's just maybe stop that for a bit. There were a few scientists who at the time were also concerned about how these low frequency sounds may be affecting our ocean life. Yeah, what does that sound like to a beluga whale? And finally, number one, the Vasa shipwreck. Back in 1628, the Vasa sunk within 20 minutes of setting sail. This is a tragedy. This claimed the lives of 30 souls on board. How tragic is this? Now, the Swedish Navy launched the ship August 10th, 1628. It was once considered a high-tech warship, even referred to as spectacular. So what the hell happened? Well, the first rush of wind caught it off guard, started making a little topsy-turny, and the second gush of wind sank it. Just like that, there was no war, there was nothing going on, just a bottle of clink, and then it went down. So fast. It's like the scene in Trek where it sinks fast comedically, but this was real life, so it wasn't comedic at all. It was actually rather terrifying. There was a crowd around and everything to send it off, but the 64 bronze cannons that were installed during the rushed process of building the warship, they were deemed too heavy, evidently. The lack of oxygen in the water allowed for its rediscovery to continue its story. That's how we know how she went down. The Vasa was built with carvings all around the king at the time, King Gustav II. So when the wreck was discovered in 1961, 95% of the wood was still intact. It's deep, dark, and cold. Yeah, nothing really, uh, nothing affects it. Humans focusing too much on naval warfare, rather on if the ship can actually stay afloat. That's a definitely a human problem. I can't tell if this is a curse or just humans being humans, but yeah, stop installing 64 bronze cannons. Number 10, the SSL Pharaoh. 15,000 feet below the surface of the Bermuda Triangle sits the SS El Faro, a 790-foot-long cargo ship. The story is tragic, but the mystery of where its crew ended up remains a mystery to this day. Did they succumb to the elements or something else? In September 2015, the Faro was set to pass right through the Bermuda Triangle while traveling from Florida to Puerto Rico. The ship was carrying 33 people in total. A tropical storm was brewing, but it was hundreds of miles away from the actual ship's route, and the cargo ship was built to withstand this kind of weather even if it did. 
But Mother Nature had other plans, and the storm transformed into a Category 3 hurricane with waves 40 feet high. The last message received from the ship said that the engine failed along with the power and that the entire ship had tilted on its side, but the crew had managed to contain the flooding and that things were for the most part under control. But that was the last message they received until a few weeks later when the El Faro was found sitting upright in Davy Jones' locker. Debris was everywhere, but there wasn't a single sign of the crew, their bodies nowhere to be seen. Number 9, the USS Cyclops. It's such a shame this ship had to go down carrying such an epic name. It was World War I, and Lieutenant G. W. Worley was sent on the dangerous task of carrying coal to Brazil to refuel Allied ships. With 309 people on board, the ship did reach Barbados in March, but after that, nothing. The USS Cyclops was never heard from again. The Navy's official statement reads, The disappearance of this ship has been one of the most baffling mysteries in the annals of the Navy, all attempts to locate her having proved unsuccessful. There were no enemy submarines in the Western Atlantic at that time, and in December 1918, every effort was made to obtain from German sources information regarding the disappearance of this vessel. How do 309 people in a massive ship go missing without a trace? One secret the Bermuda Triangle aims to keep. Number 8, Flight 19. The year, 1945. On December 5th, five Avenger torpedo bombs. I know I got excited too, but unfortunately unrelated to Marvel. Under the command of Lieutenant Charles Taylor from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, set out with 13 student pilots. Guess what happened? They disappeared. But it got super weird before they did. About an hour and a half into the flight, Taylor radioed that something was going wrong with their compasses, that they weren't working. He thought they were over the Florida Keys and so was told to head north, but Taylor got confused and the team kept heading out to sea. Night fell and before long all communication with the 13 petered out and the entire crew disappeared without a trace. To this day, the planes have never been recovered and remained trapped beneath the waves of the Bermuda Triangle. Number 7. Jupiter's Moon not to be confused with Jupiter Ascending, that was a terrible film, don't watch that one. The Jupiter Moon Ganymede is a bit of a mystery. NASA's Juno spacecraft caught a FM radio signal coming from that giant's moon. This moon has a salty subsurface ocean. In the past, I've mentioned a similar signal that was coming from Saturn, so I don't know. Saturn could be its own thing. Oceans in space, I've seen the Avengers, you know what I mean? What if aliens come to our oceans next? Who's gonna fight them? The boardwalk water jetpack guy? What's he gonna do? We have nothing, we have no tools to combat anything deep in our oceans. We're screwed. Jupiter has 79 moons, so whatever's sending these signals, well, I feel like there's many more coming. It's just a matter of when. Number six, can't you hear me knocking? This knocking sound here was picked up by an underwater hydrophone, and like many others on this list, we had no idea what we were hearing for a long time. We were absolutely stumped. The ocean is already unexplored and freaky as is, so unexplained signals definitely aren't welcoming, especially signals like this. Before we talk about what that sound is coming from, imagine being in the deep, dark, icy waters and then you hear that sound out of nowhere. What do you do? Do you panic? Do you just, uh, that's it, I'm gonna die. That's an alien, for sure. This is something out of the quarry. What is making that sound? These are haunting waters. But as it turns out, the real source isn't as scary as Megalodon or aliens. This is actually the sound of a species of haddock fish. Yeah, just a loud lunch going on down there, no biggie. These type of haddock are ray-finned fish that can be found in the North Atlantic Ocean. Now the males of the species will produce this pulsating drum sound in order to attract a mate. Like Matthew McConaughey from Wolf of Wall Street, he'll just smack his chest for hours on end. He'll just beatbox under a rock until he's married. How great is that? Outside of the mating season, the same noise can be heard, but this time it's aggressive. This time you want to stay away. When it's not mating season, that, that sound there, that's for scaring away other fish. Number five, Russian space signals. Russian astronomers picked up this signal using the Rattan 600 radio telescope. It's a large radio observatory in southwestern Russia, and it was the same idea. The signal was coming from a nearby star, and that's all we know, because that's all we can see. Specifically, star HD 164595. Awesome, that rolls off the tongue. It was roughly 95 light years away from Earth, so a bit further away than the last one. Again, it's far enough where we don't need to worry about what's sending the signal, if anything is sending it for that matter. 
But again, this star is known to have a planet like ours near its orbit. Number four, 2007 first radio burst. That's right, back in 07, scientists Duncan Lorimer and David Narkovec, they both discovered the first FRB, the first, first F, the F, F, RB, the FFRB? Now I'm lost. The thing is, these flashes of energy, they only last for milliseconds, right? They're galaxies away and they're very random and they're that fast, so. You can't really predict them and study them. They're 100 times more powerful than the sun, so it was important to these two scientists that further research was done, which is a pretty good thing, or else this wouldn't get, you know, a video, or nothing would be made, I guess. Thanks, lads. The conclusion was that these bursts, they happen thousands of times a day. Space is unfathomably large. So far, the candidates for sending out these cosmic paparazzi flashes, so far, scientists believe they're from neutron stars or they're from white dwarfs. Otherwise, they're still mysterious and we have no idea who or what is sending them. But either way, we're listening. We're here, you know what I mean? Smash the thumbs up if you can hear us. Hit that like button. Thanks. Number three, Star Tiger. The Star Tiger was supposed to arrive at 5 a.m. in Bermuda, but as you can guess, that never happened. In fact, this would be the last flight it would ever take. Captain B. W. McMillan was flying with World War II hero Air Marshal Sir Arthur Conningham on January 30th, 1948 from England to Bermuda. The Star Tiger was a British South American Airways Tudor 4 plane. Official records state that the aircraft's heater was unreliable and may have failed or that the compass was at fault. But as for what actually happened, that must lie with whatever natural anomalies surrounded that area. McMillan decided to fly at around 2,000 feet, which is pretty low, but he was trying to avoid the strong wind due to the Gulf Stream in the area. The last time they reported their position was at 3.15 a.m., and they were on track to arrive at 5 a.m., but they never showed up. Now, flying so low meant they would have little room to maneuver and burn fuel faster. So perhaps it was due to natural events that something happened, but when it comes to the Bermuda Triangle, who can be sure? Number one, last but not least, the Tyne Mouth Electron. What can money, an aggressive PR assistant, and a boat buy you? Well, for Donald Crownhurst, he thought it would crown him a winner of the Sunday Times Golden Globe race, an event that required each contestant to sail around the world alone. Thing is, he was pretty new to sailing. But with a substantially large financial backer, Crowhurst had a lot riding on this adventure. He set sail from London on October 3rd, 1968, but almost turned back after his boat started having some problems. He decided to man a Tremarin. Unfortunately, it was poorly built and the new improvements Crowhurst made fell apart like paper in water. But nevertheless, he kept calm and carried on, even reporting to his publicist that he was having a grand old time. Thing is, he never left the Atlantic. This is his route compared to the others. On his return, he feared that his deceptions would be revealed, so he jumped ship. His ship, the Electron, was abandoned in the Bermuda Triangle in July 1969, and many suspect that the unusual energy of the area is what drew the man to madness. 